Live from San Francisco, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering Oracle Open World 2015. Brought to you by Oracle. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Brian Gracely. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live here in San Francisco, SiliconANGLE's The Cube, our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Brian Grace, the analyst at wikibon.com, and uh, we are kicking off day two. Actually, technically day one, but for day two for us, yesterday was the opening. Uh, Tim Jennings, Chief Research Officer, is here with us from Ovum IT. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much, thanks for having me on. I love the analyst segment because we get to dig into the <laughs> critical analysis, because there's, there's lots. Um, and there's a lot, lots to talk about, obviously. So first thing I want to get your take on is Mark Hurd's keynote just came uh, off the stage. We did a little bit of uh, intro there. Uh, your take on his uh, performance and his predictions. I mean, he's talking about some pretty bold things. He's actually pegging some numbers to this, these uh, predictions, 2025 among others. Your yeah. thoughts? Well, it's interesting. I think you know, he opened by setting what was a pretty um, grim picture in some ways. You know, saying, look, things are, things are tough out there. Um, so I, th I think that message was interesting. Um, I'm really setting the context for uh, how is this whole cloud thing going to play out. I think with the predictions, um, yeah, it, some of them are quite bold. So I think talking about 80% of those um, production apps moving to the cloud in, in the next 10 years, I mean, I think that broadly mirrors our view so our latest cloud forecast sort of shows, you know, 21% growth over through to 2020. So I think that's a reasonable sort of number. All the vendors love to have their shows. They need to have a horse to ride it on. Hey, yeah, we're going to do this. We're singing over the world. Yeah, we're going to be number one and everything. Yeah. What's your data show? You guys have an independent research firm. What's your What's yeah. your take on this? Does his story hang together? Yeah, I think I think it does hang together. I think. Um, if you look at that sort of cloud growth, as saying, I think you know our forecasts, um, we're looking five years forward, but I think it shows that we're going to see that that sort of move. Um, I think then, if you think about how those different segments are going to move, um, Larry Ellison last night talked about you know that sort of generational shift, being in the early days of it. But I think, you know, I think we are at that stage, and certainly when I talk to both the CIOs and to, to line of business execs, we're seeing, I think, particularly yeah. through digital transformation, that shift's happening, and, and quite fast. Larry, yesterday said on the keynote, you know, hey, we're Oracle, we're in the app business, we're in the SaaS business, we learned that we needed to have Pass platform as a service, yep. and we got in the platform as a service business. And we realized we had to be in the infrastructure as a service business. And then hell, why not just re-engineer everything, rewrite the code to go, you know, across infrastructure, platform, and software as a service? So I got to ask you a question. That being said, which by the way, I like that message. I yeah. think that's solid. And I think they're in a very good fortified position. But they have competitive pressure from both fronts. They have the SaaS vendors like Oracle, Workday, SAP, Salesforce. Salesforce. Yeah. I mean, sorry, Salesforce. And then infrastructure pressure from Amazon and others. Yeah. So, how do you make of their past platform? The, the new middleware model is the cloud. Yeah. It's one big middleware cloud, integrated well, cloud. What's yeah. your take on it? Absolutely, well I think you know, it's, been, it's been very interesting this week. I think, um, so for a, for a few years, you know, Larry and Oracle have talked about that huge fusion project to, to move the apps to the cloud. Um, I think they've, they've suddenly realized that the, the scale of moving the whole middleware to the cloud, you know, is, is, is a big project, but an absolutely necessary one. Um, I think what's interesting this year is, you know, you could take the easy option and say, okay, you know what, we've got this huge middleware portfolio, you know, we're, we're a leader in middleware, we're going to start moving things to the cloud. Um, I think this year it's clear that they've gone more all in so I think they're being pretty aggressive with that middleware portfolio and saying, we've got to go cloud first. And I think that's the big change this year. Yeah, you, you talked a minute ago about digital transformation driving a lot of these enterprises. Who's driving it within the enterprise though? I mean, for a long time we've heard about shadow IT, IT was afraid of the cloud. Is, is shadow IT driving these digital transformations or is IT retooling themselves? What are you hearing from your clients? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, shadow IT, um, was a little bit of a red herring. I think you know, in the early days, 
you certainly saw you know the the CMOs some of the you know the other line of business execs were sort of leap going solo almost but actually I, I think that's that happens less now I think you know we're seeing a, a more collaborative approach so they understand that they can't actually do it all alone I think you know you need the whole the whole business really um, you know working together on that digital transformation so there's certainly more of a role for the CMO for the chief HR officer but I think there's more now um, the CIO, the CTO, maybe the chief digital officer, you know, a helping line of business collaborating on that change. Shadow IT is interesting. I mean, shadow IT, for the folks who don't know what shadow IT is, is you go around IT in the shadows to get stuff done. You go to the cloud, Amazon, for instance, great shadow IT uh, platform to get stuff done because IT basically sucks and you go around them to, to go to the cloud. So, yeah. okay, but shadow IT is, has been the best advertising for the cloud because what it does is gets the business case on the table very, very rapidly. Yeah. And so when the guy goes out and says, hey, look what I did with big data, look what I do in the cloud, I went around IT, great, let's operationalize that. Here's the ops guy. Guess what happens next? The whole thing's dead. So, I mean, are you seeing that same operationalizing? Because shadow IT has been a good R&D background, it's been legitimized yeah. now with cloud. Yes. I mean, so what's that operational look like? I mean, now you got to come in and integrate security audit, here's my security guy, there's my telecom audit. What do you what do you make of the shadow IT trend of operationalizing the cloud from that angle? Yeah, well, you know, I think the whole key part of that proposition is taking away as much as possible of that burden as you can. So, I, mean, I think it's very clear that it's taking away um, headcount that you would otherwise have in-house to do to do a lot of that stuff. I think the interesting thing is when you see some of the benefits from those early projects, I think it's a real kind of pathfinder effect in the organization. If you look at the contrast between, okay, you know, we've, we've gone with HCM or recruitment in the cloud, look at the benefits we're getting from it. When it comes up to your next project, you're kind of saying, why would I want to do all of that stuff in-house now? And by the way, it's going to take me, you know, six months, a year, 18 months to do it. The guy who just did that last project delivered it in you know, three or four months. So it's a, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, so, you know, obviously lots of talk about SaaS applications. People understand those. Uh, try to throw some punches at infrastructure as a service, whether they're going to play there, we'll see. What are you guys seeing around the pass layer, right? There's a bunch of different options. I mean, Heroku, uh, you know, Amazon's doing some things, Cloud Foundry, obviously the whole fusion. What, what do you see in that space, and how much do customers even understand that concept yet? I think so. I don't think they understand it that well. Yeah. Um, I think what they do understand is, is the use cases for it. So I think you know, early pattern we're seeing is moving that dev test to the cloud. So you know, the, the typical ratio of, of dev tests to, to production systems, you're looking at you know, a range of three to one to 10 to one uh, in, in terms of the infrastructure. So I think, again, moving as much as, as you can of that to the cloud. But I think now people understand it's not just the infrastructure, it's a much wider platform, so you know you need to have your integration there. You, know, you need to have your mobile development. You need to have you know, your document services, your analytic services. So I think people are understanding it's a it's a bigger platform. Um, and then the next bridge, I think, is is looking at sort of SaaS extension. So where people say, okay, we've taken on this particular cloud app, but we do need to perhaps build a custom extension to it. It's, it's less. People are working much more on configuration rather than customization. But there will still be the instances where, where you need to do that. And I think you know, that's where the PaaS element will come in to say, yeah, you know, that's now the way to deliver that quickly and in a way we can manage. And again, we, you know, we don't need that big cost behind it. Well, he talks about customers maybe getting it. I mean, not, we're definitely seeing people realize they got to get developers. I mean, we saw GE on stage, we saw GE on stage at AWS reInvent, we saw them on stage at CloudFound. Yeah. If nothing else, they're trying to recruit developers, they're trying to create this sort of sexiness around, hey, we're building new modern stuff. Yeah. I think if anything, that's what Paz is creating, is businesses are going, I better start hoarding developers and hiring them any way I can. Yeah, uh, and I think you know, in, in the initial stages, 
Um, it was very Java-centric. And I think, make no mistake, you know, for, for enterprise development, Java, and Java and is still, you know, a uh, key part of that. But you're right, you know, for new digital projects, people want to use you know, new tools, new, new frameworks. So I think we've seen this week that there's more of that coming into um, the, the Oracle PaaS has layer, um, but also I think that they they do need to, to work on that, that developer community, and we're seeing through some of the developer cloud services that now there's better options to do development in the cloud, to collaborate, to use you know, non-Oracle um, standards-based framework, so that's good. Tim, talk about the cost um, savings between pass and infrastructure service. You know, one of the things we were teasing out yesterday, uh, in, in, to give you some color uh, and time to think about it, is cost of ownership. Total cost of ownership, classic shark fin, iceberg, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot under there that people need to understand. So, like, the numbers straight up look good on cloud, but over the life of a project, both that infrastructure and platform as a service, it gets interesting. What is the real cost savings in, with, between the two, platform and infrastructure? Can you share your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's impossible to put a put a figure on it. It's it's very dependent on on the particular organisation their scenario. But I think you know, what you what you do see um, if you if you start moving some of that stuff that you're doing in house to the cloud. Um, you're taking away uh, a, a huge chunk of that operational stuff that you know you, you've been running in house. I think the, the trick to it though is there is going to be that interim period. So if you do move some to the, some of those workloads to the cloud, um, you still got to support those on-prem systems. So I think you know that's. That's the trick for people to work over the next decade. But where's the sizzle and the steak on the terms of the numbers? When I say sizzle and steak, where's the attention and where's the meat on the bone? Because when is it is it the pass or infrastructure? From a from a from a CXO standpoint, look at cloud. Obviously, yeah. economic economic benefits are huge. But where is the, where's the focus? Where do people go to first? What gets people's attention? Where's the meat on the bone? Well, I, I think you have to come back to SaaS first. So I think you know, SaaS. You're saying okay, someone's going to do all of that that for me. The PaaS may be the extension piece to help you build on that. Um, I think for, for me, we, we see that it's the PaaS that's going to be the faster growing, growing segment. I mean, I think fundamentally, it'll be part of the transition over that next decade. Yeah. But I think, you know, the, the principles of this, you're going to want to move as much of that stuff out of your organization as possible. Yeah. Anyway, we heard it in the keynote this morning, you know, GE, Avaya, AIG. GE, they were at the Amazon oh. event too. And GE was on stage with Andy yeah. Jassy and said, uh, yeah. Amazon's our part for the next 100 years. How do you reconcile that? Are they just shopping for, uh, you know? We're looking for developers. Yeah. I, I, here's the, the, the sexy thing is, there are lines of business managers out there who are going, I've got an idea. And in the past, I had to go through IT and I had to go through this long process. Yeah. And they're now going, I can cobble together three or four developers. I can either go to some platform as a service or, or Amazon, and I can have a mobile app in three months. And I can go around and go, I can change the business just like that. And I think that's the sexiness. Does that scale? They got to figure out how to scale that. But that's the sexiness. That's the thing that goes idea to execution in three months. Yeah. And, and I look like a business changer, right? Yeah. That's what people are excited about, I think. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's where the sort of multimodal approach comes in. As you say, people want to do those digital projects quickly, but at some point, a lot of them need to be scaled up for, for right, enterprise yeah. grade. The, the excitement goes away, yeah, I don't want to deal with it And now you've yeah. got to do it. And I think, you know, that's when you come in, okay, I've got to take care of security. I've got to take care of patching this stuff. You know, I may need to scale it to, to a big audience. So I think you know, for, for the majority in the long run, that's something they want to move out. So talk about the thing that we were addressing on, key, on the uh, post keynote review that Brian and I were going through. We looked at Oracle as a really strong position. Right now, they are, they're middleware. They got a nice fortified position competitively and product, and obviously the numbers hurts uh, flaunting them around. Uh, so they're, they're solid, right? So they're in good position. Now they got competitive landscape from all different angles. And the thing that we asked, we talked about was speculating, they could actually win it all here if they go beyond the red stack. So one of the things that we were talking about a few events ago was the notion of inter-clouding. Certainly Pat Gelsby from VMware will be like, oh, there'll be multiple clouds, right? So in a multi-cloud environment, not just Oracle, where does, the, where does the customer get 
the solution? Is Oracle going to be compatible in that environment? What about that customer says, hey, I got to move stuff around different clouds. Guys, what do you think? What's the thoughts? I want to get your perspective on this, this uh, open question. I, I would definitely, I definitely think the approach that Oracle's taken to this, so it's very standards based. I think you know they're aware of that issue of portability. You already see it into the into the PaaS layer. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think in in a in a multi-cloud environment, and it, I still think there is a, you know, there will be a trend to having a key strategic provider here. But that said, yeah, that you know, we'll still have hybrid mix of services. But I think I Oracle is well placed in that environment. So it's not a winner take all, it's winner take most model, it's right? Winner so, take. And that's what Heard was saying on stage. Yeah, it's it's winner he take. said two vendors, I think it might be three, but three or I four. I would go for three. Yeah, yeah. And then three maybe four. Three. Brian, what's your take on this interclouding trend? Obviously Oracle is in a good position to be one of the top three yeah, uh, tier vendors I, I, in the cloud. I, I'm not sure I'm convinced there's going to be two or three. I think there's they're probably going to be at least a half a dozen. I mean, we've got mobile is a huge trend, IoT is a huge trend. Uh, you know, some of the SaaS applications are, are taking off. I think it's, it's the great position for Oracle and for a few of these is it's a huge investment. So you've got to look at the guys that have the dollars to be able to keep making those investments. But yeah. you look at you know how different Asia and Asia Pacific is. Their requirements are going to be different. Nobody's talking about Baidu and Tencent and all those kind of companies. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of economics that go on around those things that isn't mentioned here, isn't even mentioned at AWS. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, to pick, to say there's going to be two, uh, I mean, we haven't seen that since back in the 60s with IBM, so. Well, the interesting yeah. thing that came up yesterday, I'd love to get your Tim's thoughts on as well, is that is there is an app cloud and there's a platform cloud. So, you know, one of the things that came up is IoT is more of an app environment. It's hard to be an IoT platform. Do you build your own or do you, do you go to an Oracle? And all the big moves from the big vendors right now are saying, hey, ingest through us and then run your apps on top of standards-based apps. So, yeah. it's interesting, there could be an app cloud market and there could be a platform cloud right. market. I mean, hey, we're, we're riffing in real time here. Thoughts? Well, I, I think, you know, there's that Put that on the research agenda. <laughs> well, that's where the I, networks start I coming mean, into play. You gotta I mean, have bandwidth between sense, them. right? I mean, that's plausible. I mean, you can't have all these platforms. That's a platform war out there right now. No, but I don't, I don't think you can separate the two. So I think you still got that very strong synergy between the apps and the, and the platform. So the extension play, yeah. you know, is, is key part of that. But there are some areas, and IoT is a good example, I think that will be very hybrid. Yeah. You know, it's uh, if you look at the whole thing, space of things. That's, we'll call them that's, tool clouds. Then there's gonna be a lot of tooling yeah. for sure. And the, I mean, and there'll the be tons be. of tools. Yeah. Call an app a tool, or well, and I think I mean, we'll, we'll see a second order thing here. Where are the automotive manufacturers going to build their platform? Where's GE going to build their platform? Where's, you know, the people that build ships and boats and oil companies? You know, where's going to be the oil and gas platform built? Is it going to be built on Oracle? Is it going to be built on Amazon? You know, that's the second order stuff that we've seen in every other big platform, whether it was PC or mainframe or something. And that's still to play out. But I think if you're, you know, if you're the, the sort of ultimate end user organization of that, you're going to be taking some of your infrastructure from one provider, yeah. and I'm, I'm not talking IT infrastructure here, you know, I'm talking yeah. physical infrastructure. Right. So that's going to come from multiple providers. One of them may have chosen Oracle as their key partner, another may have chosen AWS. So you've got to integrate those, those two. Well, and, and, and we're talking about some, some people here who don't own network. Google owns network, AT&T yeah. owns network. Oracle doesn't own network, Amazon doesn't own network. There's going to be some interesting interplay with those things as well that we don't really talk about here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting you know, if you look at the, the telco service providers, they certainly see a big opportunity still, um, both in M2M as they would right. refer to it and also in, you know, in the overall sort of cloud services play. Um, but you know, I, I think fundamentally, um, I think Oracle's hand is strong because they're playing across all three tiers. And I think with that solid play, I think they're well placed to provide a solution, whereas perhaps others can only provide one one slice or one one tier. Tim, we got to wrap here, but I want to get you the final word on the future scenario for Oracle. Obviously, user experience, simplicity seems to be obviously the key. Automation, they have a lot of stuff pre-built into Oracle from years of experience, so they can bring that to the table. How important is the notion of simplicity and standing up? cross-prem and on public cloud capabilities for Oracle. Is that a critical factor for them? Yeah, I think it's critical in two ways. So it's critical from an IT perspective, so you need to make that as simple to, to stand up, you know, as simple to manage as possible. 
but I think even more importantly, it's critical from a business perspective. You know, if you're taking a lot of that operations out of the business, you want to be using that really for your business people to build solutions. All right, CrowdChat is jamming right now. Go to crowdchat.net slash OW15. Join the conversation. This is The Cube. We'll be right back. More from Oracle Open World, live on Howard Street in San Francisco. This is The Cube. I'm John Furrier with Brian Gracie. We'll be right back after this short break. Thank you.